For a gift that's always on time and lasts a lifetime, you can't do better than Masterclass. Masterclass is the only streaming platform where you can learn and grow with over 200 of the world's best. That's why Wirecutter calls it an invaluable gift. When you give the gift of Masterclass, your loved ones can learn from so many different incredible, fascinating, sometimes genius instructors. Help them confidently navigate the media with the influential intellectual Noam Chomsky. Or use science to solve problems with Bill Nye. Or learn from the past from the Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. I remember falling in love with Masterclass as soon as I found out about it. I personally love Margaret Atwood's, and I think you will too. Plus, there's no risk. Every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Masterclass always has great offers during the holidays, sometimes up to as much as 50% off. Head over to masterclass.com slash magical for the current offer. That's up to 50% off at masterclass.com slash magical. Masterclass.com slash magical. I obviously love that therapy is becoming more normalized and more destigmatized as a part of self-care and wellness. But the thing is, finding the right therapist can be really daunting, especially if you're new to therapy. And that can ironically add stress to your mental load. Enter ZocDoc, the low-stress way to find and book the right therapist for your specific needs. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare high-quality in-network doctors, choose the right one for your needs, and click to instantly book an appointment. We're talking about in-network appointments with more than 100,000 healthcare providers across every specialty, from mental health to dental health, eye care to skin care, and much more. I get very picky about choosing my doctors. I get very nervous to call up and make an appointment. I just... I have medical anxiety like that. And ZocDoc really takes so much of that stress away. Plus, ZocDoc appointments happen fast, typically within just 24 to 72 hours of booking. You can even score same-day appointments. Truly, I personally have been using it for six years, and I really recommend you check it out too. So stop putting off those doctor's appointments and go to ZocDoc.com magical to find and instantly book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash magical. ZocDoc.com slash magical. Welcome to the Magical Overthinkers podcast, a show for thought spiralers, exploring the subjects we can't stop overthinking about, from burnout to crushes. If you ever get the feeling that despite living in the information age, life only seems to be making less sense, if you can connect to the idea that for some mysterious reason, it just feels especially hard to exist as a human in the world right now, then you're in the right place. This podcast is here to soften the clash between our innate human irrationalities and the overwhelm of this time. It's here to help us think less about the things that don't matter and more about the things that do. I'm your host, Amanda Montel. Today, we're overthinking about career jealousy. I'd venture to say that if you clicked on this episode, you might be able to relate to that stomach-sinking feeling that you're behind in your career somehow, or that other people have something that you don't, professionally speaking. This is a feeling that I can relate to all too intimately, and it is so unpleasant. It can completely overtake your brain. I have spent a lot of my working adult life trying to figure out What is the source of these feelings of career jealousy, and how can I remedy them? I read in a 2017 paper titled The Evolutionary Psychology of Envy and Jealousy, we'll link it in our show notes, that the way most of us experience career jealousy is actually counterintuitive. Weirdly, we tend not to feel jealous of people who are way far ahead of us in their careers. Instead, we often feel jealous of people who just have a little bit more than we already do. So for example, As an author, I've never felt jealous of someone like Margaret Atwood or Stephen King or any other writerly living legend. That would feel ridiculous. Instead, whenever I've had those horrible pangs of occupational envy, it's always been towards someone who I perceive to be, say, 25 or 50 percent more successful than myself. It's counterintuitive because in theory, the less you have, the more you should aspire to, right? But jealousy is fundamentally irrational, whether you're talking about romantic relationships or your career, which is why scientists don't really know for sure why we experience it. 
Speaking of romantic relationships, that's the context in which jealousy is most often empirically studied. Check out our episode number two, Overthinking About Monogamy, if you haven't already. And the adaptive benefits of romantic jealousy are still somewhat poorly understood, in part because the way that people experience jealousy tends to be so messy and self-sabotaging. Career jealousy, though, seems to me to be especially ripe for thought spiraling. Because while jealousy itself seems to me like a pretty instinctive, almost animal experience, the concept of a career is societally constructed. So there seems to be this inherent clash between the messy, irrational jealousy feelings we naturally have and these professional goals that are unnaturally foisted upon us. I want to share with you this very interesting quote from a section of the Journal of Economic History, Volume 65, titled The History of the Modern Career and Introduction, in which researchers John Brown, Marco H.G. Van Leeuwen, and David Mitch comment on the role of this visceral feeling of jealousy in helping us figure out what we really want in life. The quote goes like this, Ironically, what you really value in life is more often revealed by asking yourself who you are jealous of rather than asking yourself directly, what do I value? The latter often taps into what society expects you to value. Your super ego takes over and you're aware only of what you should want rather than what you really want. Envy and jealousy, on the other hand, kick in as a gut reaction in your emotional slash evaluative system long before you can become conscious of it. So in theory, Jealousy can help us tap into our gut instincts about our values to help us understand ourselves a little better. Still, I am just generally very suspicious of the part that it plays in a setting as new and manufactured as career. After all, this concept of a career, not a job, but a career, has only been around since the 1800s. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, a bunch of socio-historical factors contributed to what we think of as a career today and its cementation as an identity-forming phenomenon, like the rise and evolution of the American dream ethos, the Industrial Revolution, the emergence of so-called managerial capitalism, which infused the workplace with notions of corporate hierarchy and rigid job roles, procedures, regulations, a sense of duty to the company, ladders to climb, nepotism. Also throughout the 20th century, you have the creation of unions, migration and immigration, various forms of discrimination, increase in college attendance, the American dream began to fool people into thinking that hard work would reward them fairly, and therefore their worth is determined by their productivity and career. Job titles began to hold social weight. Later in the 1980s, the advent of the 9 to 5 and corporate culture further empowered this notion of the career. And more recently, there was the rise of tech in the workplace, which overall rendered work less social, less physical, and more abstract. This has created kind of a thought spirally problem because our economies are no longer industrial, but rather mainly knowledge based. This means that the bulk of what work is today, namely thinking, creating, analyzing cerebral things, is actually less materially productive than the type of work that people were doing when this concept of a career first emerged. That is all to say that the way we conceptualize work and thus perhaps also careers, is somewhat incompatible with the way that we as human beings actually work today. For instance, it may be unhelpful to measure productivity by hours spent physically in the office if one's job is mostly thinking, since a more thought-conducive environment for most people is outdoors or perhaps not in the office at all. Ultimately, our outdated conceptualization of work and career importance combines with these sort of innate social instincts that don't obey logic, all of which creates this sort of false equivalence between our professional success and our self-worth. And yet unpacking why career jealousy is such a widespread phenomenon doesn't necessarily help us feel better. For that, we need to turn to today's guest. Daniel Space, better known as Dan from HR, is an HR professional turned social media creator who makes these really accessible, heart-on-sleeve, transparent videos debunking myths of the workplace. 
In trying to find the right sort of guest for today's topic, I put out a call on Instagram for recommendations from listeners, and one person enthusiastically recommended Dan from HR. I found our conversation so incredibly delightful, soothing, illuminating, and I really hope you enjoy it. So with that, here is our conversation over thinking about career jealousy with Daniel Space. Dan, thank you so much for joining this episode of Magical Overthinkers. I would love to ask if you could just introduce yourself and your work to our listeners. Of course, and thank you so much for having me. My name is Daniel Space, but everyone knows me as Dan from HR. I've worked in HR as a business partner for companies like Spotify, Electronic Arts, and in 2020, as everyone did in the pandemic, I started going out to TikTok a lot. And in one of the worst job markets we ever had, I started to see a rise of people who had no idea what they were talking about, charge people for some really, really, really bad advice. So it was actually anger that made me inspired to make my own account. The first video, when I think back, I regret because it was a stitch saying, don't listen to this person, they're wrong. But that's essentially how I got to start making content. From there, then I kind of pivoted away from debunking other people just to saying, here's how it actually works. And I've been a content creator and consultant ever since. Uh, It's so hard to conceive of the idea when you first start posting things on the internet that like it could become something and then like people will hold you to it. (laughs) It's a trip. It's shocking. It is. It's shocking. I'm shocked by it every day. (laughs) So I want to pose to you the question that I open all of my magical overthinkers interviews with. And it is simply, what is an irrational thought spiral that's been living rent-free in your head lately? Oh my God, this is... is, (laughs) I have not been able to shake the idea that the world is an experiment. When I started to travel, when I left the United States and I went into Europe and I went to South America, I couldn't help but notice this thing was like this, but just a little bit different. This religion is like this, but this is a little bit different. This country has this, but it doesn't have this. And I'm like, I think we're less in a simulation and more of an experiment. Which one gets people to happiness faster or the fastest? Which one works and which one doesn't? It's funny that you said the word happiness. Do you think it's happiness that we're all after? I think we're after that. I don't think the producers of the experiment are. (laughs) I think what they're looking for is success. God, it's so hard to define what happiness and success even mean. <laughs> those are True. those are those are foundational <laughs> questions for potentially another day. I don't know. It's like, why are we all here? <laughs> what about you? Can I ask you that question now? Oh my God. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned traveling abroad. I just spent six weeks immersed in other cultures. I was out of the country. And whenever I leave the United States, it's an invitation to, I guess overthink about, but I think it's it's the right amount of thinking, about how much of my personality and my value system is shaped by American capitalism and how much is shaped by my most like unmitigated self, <laughs> which like, who even is that? But I'm like, you know, observing Italians, they move through the world with like a sense of a little bit of cynicism and also at the same time ease because they don't have the same like illusion of opportunity there. And so, you know, if you have a big dream, that delusion might not be fed in the same way or maybe it's not a delusion, whatever. Uh, it's it's an aspiration that might not be supported there in the same way that it is in the U.S. But at the same time, that's also liberating because you're not like plagued by striving, <laughs> which may, like may not lead to anything. So, yeah, it's I, I mean, whatever. It's always so helpful to immerse yourself in other value systems as a way of reorienting yourself around like what you truly value and who you truly are. And so I've been thinking a lot about that. I had the most magical moment in 2017. I had a bunch of stuff happen. I had a bad breakup. And for the first time in my life, I decided to leave the country. So I sold my apartment. I sold my car. And I went to South America for seven months. And when I was in this little tiny city in Chile, I did not know if it was May or June. And that mindset of like, I was, my days used to be blocked up into nine hour blocks of meetings. And I'm like, is it May or is it June? I didn't want to bring out my phone. I was like, so the moment of that revelation, I was like, oh my God, we are stuck in so many boxes. Dude, it is so funny that you mention that sort of like nebulous orientation around time because I remember on another trip to Italy I went to a town where the very first clock (laughs) in all of Italy and maybe the world I'm gonna have to fact check that was displayed it was like the small Italian town oh my god and it was just so funny to kind of like reckon with the idea that like before the invention of clocks 
there was no such thing as like starting our interview at 11 a.m. sharp. You know, like there was no such thing as like the bus is five minutes late or I need to charge someone for these six extra minutes of time. It's like the pizza might be served around sundown. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it was just like we think of time and minutes and more closely connected to today's subject, like the seven day week and the five day work week. We think of these things as so rigid and so foundational, but they're like totally a construction. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And one we've just all agreed to buy into for some reason. For some fucking reason. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of work to have to like question every little system and undo every little system. We have to choose our battles in this world. <laughs> yeah. For a gift that's always on time and lasts a lifetime, you can't do better than Masterclass. Masterclass is the only streaming platform where you can learn and grow with over 200 of the world's best. That's why Wirecutter calls it an invaluable gift. Truly, what could be better than giving the gift of learning? When you give the gift of Masterclass, your loved ones can learn from so many different incredible, niche, fascinating, sometimes genius instructors. Help them confidently navigate the media with the influential intellectual Noam Chomsky. Or use science to solve problems with Bill Nye. Or learn from the past from the Pulitzer Prize winning historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. I remember falling in love with Masterclass as soon as I found out about it. Truly, what could be better than getting a one-on-one -on -one course with one of history's luminaries? I personally love Margaret Atwood's, and I think you will too. Plus, there's no risk. Every new membership comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Masterclass always has great offers during the holidays, sometimes up to as much as 50% off. Head over to masterclass.com slash magical for the current offer. That's up to 50% off at masterclass.com slash magical. Masterclass.com slash magical. So uh, pivoting back to the topic at hand, although like time is an illusion, conversational topics are an illusion, all that matters is flow. So <laughs> in moving with that sense of flow, I want to ask you, what is your personal relationship to today's topic, that being career jealousy? What has been your journey with it? Why don't we start with defining that? So when you say that, what specifically do you mean? Well, career jealousy is a bit up to interpretation. I mean, for me, I guess I perceive it as observing other people in probably your same field and feeling like they're further along than you are. And thus you have an inferiority complex about it. And you start thought spiraling about why they're ahead and why you're behind. What factors have contributed to that? Why is this unfair? Why do I suck? <laughs> And how that can kind of be self-sabotaging, but also maybe motivating in certain contexts. So perfect. What's so ironic about this is that I get the joy of living it on two polar extremes. So as an HR business partner, talking with people all the time about why am I not further in my career? Why did this person get hired? They have three years less experience. I went on LinkedIn. And all I consistently reinstate back to them is, one, someone is jealous of you. And two, everyone moves at their own pace. So I, I love the idea of one of the last things you had said about using that as motivation of, I'm not as far ahead as I want to be. Great. Now that you've identified that, what are you going to do about it? And how do we make that plan? Because it's one thing to just sit and stew, but it's another to do things about it. What's ironic is I can't take my own advice. So I'm suffering that currently. So my first TikTok account, I got almost to 200,000 followers in like two years. I was being featured on news outlets. I got my first brand deals, which I was like, I'm like, what? You, all I got to do is make a video for 30 seconds and you pay me $2,000. What? That's a thing? And I was suffering from major imposter syndrome. I'm like, uh, guys, this company wants me to say this product is great. <laughs> <laughs> and then my account got banned and it was banned for one of the dumbest reasons. Someone just didn't like me, made four videos about me, later apologized, but he was a big influencer. TikTok has one of the worst moderations ever. So I saw 72 marks of like child porn and inappropriate content. And so TikTok has immediately shut it down. I filed like a hundred appeal cases, nothing ever got responded to. And then oh um, three months later, they finally said, Hey, we're sorry. We took a look at your account. It does look like the, there were fraudulent charges against you, but your account's been deleted. So I had to restart. And my thought was, okay, I built it one from the first ground. I can get it back up, but this is a very different time. We're not in the pandemic anymore. The job search base is really saturated and people who I helped boost their account are now 200,000 followers above me, blue check marks. One of them is a, a really close friend and she reached out to me for advice on how to answer questions. And I'm like, why aren't they reaching out to me? 
So I'm trying to balance through that now, just like feeling now like that I'm potentially irrelevant or that managing through making sure it's between the ego and my more deeper side of being happy for them. And the reason I boosted them is because I, I like their content. They deserve the success versus how do I use that potentially as motivation to get back to where I was as well? Oh, it is so hard, especially like because in this society, we are, I don't want to say forced, but we are heavily coerced into putting not only the stake of our livelihoods, but the stake of our self-worth into companies like TikTok, if you're a social media creator, or let's say, you know, the firm that you work for or something like that, companies that ultimately might betray you, not on purpose. They don't give a shit about us, you know? And so it can be like so hard, nearly impossible <laughs> to win. <laughs> Just such like an American concept in general. Like we cannot win this like career game, this like totally rigged game. Uh, it is... <laughs> So, so hard. Okay, so thank you so much for sharing that story. I think, you know, probably a lot of people can relate to having a curveball thrown at them that's caused them to need to start over. As an HR professional, I'm wondering if you could talk about some examples of times when you've personally witnessed career jealousy manifest in the workplace and what were the consequences of those dynamics? So there's a few, there's one story I love to think of as a great story with a great outcome. And there was one that I kind of think is a great story for how not to do it. There was one person, this is early on in my career, and this is at a company where salespeople were essentially encouraged to be competitive with each other. And there was one person who had developed a reputation for being very gossipy and a little bit of a betrayer. And so as a result, people did not want to work with her. They did not trust that they could be themselves. They did not trust that she would not do inappropriate things in order to get ahead. As a result, she was consistently put on the lowest earning commission. She was constantly put in like enterprise markets versus like the big market and the big clients. And once every six months, we would have a conversation about it. And she would say, I, I just feel like this is not fair. This is not fair. I could tell in every one of these all hands, because I was the HR business partner to sales, when the salespeople would announce saying, hey, congratulations, this person just sold you know, to Johnson & Johnson for an $8 million deal. Great. Congratulations. And I would just look at her and she would just be seething. Mm. And I, for three years, she did not move. Feedback was attempted to be given to her, but she didn't want to accept it or she would up front. But then two months later, sort of something similar would happen again. And so she was given enough work that she was good at and proved herself that she was good at. But I think back and think to myself, that was three years that you centered yourself in resentment and jealousy and how unfair this was. And when I think back, I'm like, I wish I was the better HR person like I was now to be able to shake her out of it. I was young. I was like 27. So I didn't know how to shake her be like, it's you. It's you. Like you have to, you have to change something. Like coming to me every six months, you can try to be supportive. I can reinforce some of the feedback I've heard, but ultimately it's you. It's so funny that you tell that story because I have seen career jealousy in the workplace where it can be self-sabotaging. And this is kind of an example of that, but the hackneyed cliche, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Like that can also apply to career jealousy. I remember when I was working in a sort of like creative corporate office years ago, one of my coworkers was just really motivated by career jealousy. She was always looking around at what other people had, their titles, their salaries, privileges that they were given. And I don't think she ever stopped to ask, like, what am I not bringing to the table that maybe they are bringing to the table that might account for that discrepancy? I think she was just thinking, like, because I'm alive and because I'm here and because I'm awesome, like, I deserve those things. But of course, I'm sure she was also motivated by extreme insecurity. Anyway, her jealousy created such a negative energy in the office. She was just like in such bad spirits all the time to the point that a few of us in the office went to our manager who was very young. Yeah, I think she was like 27 to sort of report like, hey, you know, it's really a struggle for us to be able to do our jobs effectively because this person is like constantly in our ear, like shit talking other people and complaining. And it's like, it's a horrible tone to set like the second that she walks in. And it's so hard to know how to hold people accountable for that type of behavior. The manager thought like, well, maybe if we just give her whatever she wants, her mood will improve and that will, you know, ameliorate the general tone of the office. So, of course, she tried that. The manager promoted her, gave her a raise, undeserved, by the way, just hoping that it would improve her mood. And then, of course, it didn't. 
It's just now she had more power. Now she could boss other people around. And so her jealousy actually got her somewhere professionally. I, I don't think it got her anywhere spiritually. <laughs> but it's such a double-edged sword. One of the worst parts about that is that it, it punishes all of you. Because you're like, oh, so I didn't do all this good work and work 60 hours to get promoted. All, all I had to do was complain. Exactly. Exactly. It's like, obviously, meritocracy is a myth. It's not like a gumball machine where you put in hard work and a beautiful gumball of success and adulation comes out. You know, it's not like that. But you'd like to think that where there are actual human beings on a close team involved, there would be some fairness. Those realizations in your career can feel like really disheartening sometimes. And I guess now that I manage people, I really try not to recreate those dynamics. <laughs> but on that topic, I wanted to ask you, from your perspective, where is the line between destructive jealousy and constructive admiration? Like, when can a little bit of envy be helpful in the workplace or professionally speaking? And then when does it actually start to hurt? So I love this question. And I think one of the things, like, if I had to redesign what I think a utopia would be, it would start with education at a young age and especially our relationship with feelings and emotions because nobody teaches us this. Nobody ever tells you like that your feelings are temporary and that as angry as you are right now, maybe you shouldn't tell that person that they're a terrible person because you're going to regret that later. And instead, I think we just pick up things from our parents. Like I was embarrassed that when I think back to my first few relationships because I played dumb games that my mom played when she was pissed, like hanging up the phone, one word answers, like that was the way to get attention instead of just saying, I'm angry and upset right now. I don't feel like talking. So I think the idea of really understanding your feelings is such a paramount to success in all elements of life. So I love when I feel jealous because it is such an unpleasant feeling, but then I get to unravel it. And I sit with it. I'm like, why do I feel jealous? What is motivating this jealousy? And in my earlier example, even over the last few months, I've been sort of proud of my my kind of transition because it was a good period of time where I did not want to celebrate my friend's successes. I saw one got a blue check and all I was just furious for a week because I'm like, I remember when you had 5,000 followers and I'm boosting your account. Here I am with 20,000 and now you're getting blue checks. And then when I sat down with it and, and unpacked that and unraveled that, I'm like, you can be happy for her. Let's be happy for her. She makes good content. You published her. You promoted her because she's good. She's great. She deserves all that success. Second, her success does not detract from yours. She just didn't take your followers. She didn't say, hey, give me the blue check and not Dan. You just are not filling these same requirements that she was at right now. And now three, what can you learn from her that she's doing? Because the video content that she's making is obviously working. So don't steal her content or ideas or anything. But what is she doing that you can do in your own way? And then how do you laugh at yourself for feeling jealous with that? So I actually ended up texting her. We spoke about it. I'm like, I'm just going to admit this is how I felt a month ago. I'm laughing at myself, but what a great self-lesson. So anyone who ever feels that way, I just, man, just love the opportunity to sit and why you're stewing and unravel that. Totally. Oh, my God. I so connect to that. Like a few years ago, I started a similar new technique for dealing with my career jealousy, where if I came across someone, say, on Instagram who I didn't know about yesterday, but today the algorithm promoted them to me and they're someone in my field who I perceive as being 25% more successful than I am or having something that I don't say a really, really fancy degree or they're like a member of the New York literati. They're like on the inside of this club or whatever, <laughs> you know, and I immediately want to like play all these mind games with myself, like do this mental contortionism act where I'm like, okay, well, they went to Harvard, but my book tour outfits are cooler. You know, like you do this like whole thing in your brain and it's so unproductive. Like it just makes you feel icky. It so does not do the math that you want it to do. So instead, like when I start to recognize myself have that impulse right away in that split second when I sense those instincts, I combat it by attempting to make a connection instead. So I have genuinely made so many professional friends by sliding into their DMs and like congratulating them on their success and asking to connect next time I'm in New York or we're going to be at the same book festival soon. Would you like to grab coffee or whatever? And like odds are but more than once, more than more than five times whenever I've connected with those people IRL, it turns out, like you said earlier, 
I had something that they wanted and they have something that I want. And the industry, like the publishing industry or whatever, set up this zero sum game, this like horribly competitive, hostile environment for us that we could just like not play. We can just like collaborate and help each other and benefit from one another in this way that sounds really corny to articulate in this way, but like it really, really works. Like connection can be your catharsis in that way. So I think the the biggest takeaway, especially from that, is our initial response to jealousy is pull away. And what's so funny is I did not know this until I I dated my my ex-boyfriend was, there was no contest. He was much, much hotter than I was. And I I felt like the luckiest guy in the world. I was like, how did this happen? But he fell in love with me. I fell in love with him. And I would see the attention he would get when we would go outside. Or I saw one time like where he and I posted an Instagram picture and he was topless and he had his little underwear showing like shorts pulled down a little bit. And it was like I wasn't even in the picture. Like this was like our anniversary picture. And what I love that whole experience because that's what taught me about how to deal with jealousy. Because the first thing I want to do, close Instagram, be mad at him for some reason. Like it's his fault when it was my insecurity. And so my feelings are mine to manage. They're not his to manage. They're not all the people commenting. And then it got to a point where I appreciated that people appreciated him because it did not impact our relationship. So the idea that you recognize that in yourself and then you jumped right into it. So instead of let me just close Instagram and go into my thought spiral, no, let me overcome this and reach out to this person. I think you should be really proud of yourself. Like that oh, is a really advanced thanks, technique. Dan. <laughs> I, you know, um, it's a journey out here and I am so bad at managing most of my thought spirals, but that is one that I feel okay about at this point. Um <laughs> Your example of like a romantic analog makes a lot of sense because I learned during the research process for this episode that most studies of jealousy are in the context of romantic relationships. They're not necessarily in the context of career. And your story kind of makes me want to pose the question. I didn't plan to ask this or anything, but you know the concept in polyamorous and ethical non-monogamy communities of compersion? It's kind of like the antidote to jealousy where like, When your romantic partner is experiencing pleasure or connection with another person, you actually feel happy for them or it's like this, you know, to me feels like a very emotionally advanced (laughs) sort of feeling. I wonder if there's like a professional equivalent to that. It's like compersion, you know, like how do we tap into that? I'm going I'm going to I'm going to share something potentially slightly TMI that I experienced it once and it surprised me because we were a little bit open we were in different countries and we were together with other people and I was like I've never seen you this excited before but there was a, and so once again I got the jealousy and then once I just found my love for him and I was like oh my god that's so cool and I'm here experiencing it I get to see this new side of him I do think it was easier in careers Whereas like with your partner, I think it is like it because I think that first feeling is I can't give them happiness that they're getting somewhere else. Yeah. But for careers, I think there's that separation. So I think in some cases it's easier, but I think in other cases it's harder because we don't know how to get there. We don't know that that's potentially like an end step to get to. And it feels almost like a betrayal of our first feelings, but it's like, why would I choose to be anything but happy if I had the possibility? What good is resentment and judging them and venting to my spouse for half an hour that why did they get promoted above me instead of... Well, that's so cool for them. They got promoted. I'm so happy and proud of them. And that promotion does not mean I'm any less. Yeah. I mean, I guess in that instance, if someone else like actually got a promotion that you didn't like, <laughs> you know, like if they did take something away from you a little bit. <laughs> True. In that case, but, yes. <laughs> but, but it really is in those situations. I feel so hard to be happy for someone who got something that you want. But I think like drawing it back to the compersion or like non-monogamous romantic example you can (laughs) this is so cringe and like pardon me for even stating it this way but like in the way that a threesome is a collab (laughs) you can collaborate (laughs) with people who are advancing in their careers in a way that you would like to emulate (laughs) like I don't think that's cringy at all I think the qualities and the the similarities between relationships dating intimacy are much closer to careers than we like to think. It's just a different perspective. And 
what I would encourage, especially, I think one of the best techniques, and I use it now, so anyone who mentions to me that they have a coworker they feel is a competitor or someone who's ahead that they just can't stand, my first thought is, is exactly what you did. Go talk to them. Yeah. I find that one of the most disarming things to say to someone is, you know what? I felt a little bit jealous of you. And they're like, you felt jealous of me. I've been jealous of you. You've been able to do blah, 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 blah. Exactly. And you don't understand the way that you're perceived in other people's mind, but that to your point, just helps open doors. They're like, oh, well, this is what I did to get promoted. And then then you're like, oh, wow, this person actually really did put in the work. Oh, and they actually articulated they wanted to get promoted. I didn't do that. And now you potentially have someone who's acting like your champion. Oh, hell, let's get you promoted. Oh, such a good point. And you said something so critical that I want to highlight just now, which is that you never know what's going on in another person's mind. You never know what's going on in another person's reality. This is a show for thought spiralers, and so it's so easy for certain folks, overthinkers, to create a fiction, to create a story, to manufacture a false logic about why certain events transpired. But you'll never really know or get any closure about that until you make yourself vulnerable and actually inquire as to what's going on. And you know what? Some people are assholes. Maybe you go and talk to that person who got promoted and they're like a narcissist and not going to be an ally to you. But at least then you know and you don't necessarily have to thought spiral about that same thing anymore. (laughs) Exactly. Now you know you did the best and you have no reason to be jealous of them anymore. A hundred percent. I obviously love that therapy is becoming more normalized and more destigmatized as a part of self-care and wellness. But the thing is, finding the right therapist can be really daunting, especially if you're new to therapy. And that can ironically add stress to your mental load. Enter ZocDoc, the low-stress way to find and book the right therapist for your specific needs. I have personally been using ZocDoc for years. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare high-quality in-network doctors, choose the right one for your needs, and click to instantly book an appointment. We're talking about in-network appointments with more than 100,000 healthcare providers across every specialty, from mental health to dental health, eye care to skin care, and much more. You can filter for doctors who take your insurance, who are located nearby and who might suit your proclivities or wants or desires. You can read reviews on there. I get very picky about choosing my doctors. I get very nervous to call up and make an appointment. I just, I have medical anxiety like that. And ZocDoc really takes so much of that stress away. Plus, ZocDoc appointments happen fast, typically within just 24 to 72 hours of booking. You can even score same-day appointments. Truly, I personally have been using it for six years, and I really recommend you check it out too. So stop putting off those doctor's appointments and go to ZocDoc.com magical to find and instantly book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash magical. ZocDoc.com slash magical. I have one more question from me, and then I want to get to some thought spirals and questions submitted by listeners. My last question, kind of a big one, but it's what problematic systems do you think career jealousy benefits? You were talking about how we as individuals want to be happy, content, fulfilled, something in life. And then the puppet masters, whoever they might be at any given moment, (laughs) just want profit, et cetera. What problematic systems are benefiting from these really unpleasant and I think unnecessary or at least unnatural feelings of career jealousy? So I think the first is, you know, that your usual suspects of misogynoir, sexism, racism, I think those stand to, to benefit the most, especially because we've seen time and time again that the system is designed for white professional men to succeed in. Women who are competitive are often reduced. Black women who are competitive are seen as angry, and these stereotypes just serve to continuously oppress them. I think more than that, what I usually try to tell people, especially as regards to job search or career jealousy, is that the odds are stacked against you. You, you can never win against the house in Las Vegas, and there's a reason for that. The best you can do is try to break even, but if you thrive within that system where you're like, I know I'm not going to make it big, here's my $200, and I'm just going to go in, I'm going to have a good time, and enjoy the experience, and I'm not going to impact my Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I have a home, I have food, I have family. That's almost the same way to, to think about it with your career. You're not going to win. The odds are stacked against you. The best thing you can do is get some experience, find out things you like, and then go out and do it on your own. Oh, my God. That is such a helpful analogy. I don't think of myself as a gambling man. Um, (laughs) I've been to Vegas. I've pulled one (laughs) slot machine once. I won $18. I walked away. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm just like, like, thank you so much. But I'm just like, I have no desire. But that's delusional because I am a gambling man. I am out here podcasting. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm trying to be a professional artist, you know? And I, in my mind, think that I can beat the house but I can't beat the fucking house. <laughs> like, there, you know, like there are only certain people who can beat the fucking house. So your really astute commentary about those problematic systems reminded me of a wonderful quote that I want to cite from a journalist named Shamat Udin, who covers the intersection of Desi identity and queerness, who I quoted in my book, The Age of Magical Overthinking, in a chapter about overconfidence bias, in which I talked about imposter syndrome and career success and career jealousy. He was really highlighting a lot of the ways that imposter syndrome and these misogynistic, racist, homophobic, otherwise exclusionary systems operate. And I'll link it in our show notes, but he wrote in an op-ed, he said, quote, the 40-hour work week was built to allow white men to succeed at work while their wives would care for all of the family's child and home responsibilities. I come to every interview, job shift, meeting 20 minutes early because I know that I have to fight the expectation of brown tardiness. There's that commentary about the fluidity of time again. I know that I need to work twice as hard to prove that I belong here. And so there is something kind of foundationally diseased about our labor market and professional culture in general in that it wasn't built for women, people of color, marginalized communities at all to exist, much less feel accepted, thrive, or beat the house. Absolutely. I want to transition to relaying a few thought spirals that were submitted by listeners because a lot of the Magical Overthinkers community could really connect to this topic of career jealousy, and I think they would love to hear from you. So here is the first overthinky question. Someone asks, how do I come to terms with my inherent suspicions that I have an innate sloth slash the fear that I want someone's career, but if I had it, I would have none of the qualities necessary to maintain it like a hermit crab crawling into a shell that's too big? They're asking, how do I come to terms with this? <laughs> I think you have. Like, I think that's great. The amount of self-review and self-reflection that you have. And then I think it depends. Okay, so now you've identified it. And I can resonate with that. Like, if I had my choice, I would sleep until three every single day and do two hours of work. Well, that, that's to me is beating the house. I'm not quite there yet, but that's the dream. You know, I used to want to be like a head of HR. I don't want that anymore. I don't want that responsibility. I don't want that time. I want to enjoy life. And I want to do as little as possible to make as much as possible to go out and do those things. So I think the idea of understanding that's who you are is great, but now what are you going to do with that? Is that something you want to change within yourself? If so, then that, that's a whole pattern of you know reprogramming your neural pathways into stop thinking of yourself as a sloth and thinking of your I think of myself as a sloth right now versus I'm a sloth and period. But I personally I have respect for that person. <laughs> Totally. I actually know the person who submitted that thought spiral and she <laughs> totally is deserving of everyone's respect. She's amazing. But actually, so I mean, I know I said we were just going to do thought spirals now, but actually that question inspired me to want to ask you something I probably should have asked you earlier, which is like, what wisdom do you have to offer as someone who has so much self-awareness about the systems that are causing all of us pain <laughs> with regard to labor and currency and value and like purpose in life. But also you are a person who participates in these systems. You you work in HR, you have a TikTok account. Like how do you reckon with that cognitive dissonance? What are some tools <laughs> or wisdoms that you have to offer? <laughs> so it's so weird, especially because TikTok is very like Gen Z, anti-work, pro-employer. And when I started to make content, it was very difficult because I would constantly get comments from people saying, but you perpetuate the system. Why are you making content about how to negotiate a better salary when you are the one who's kind of gatekeeping? And I got to a point where I'm like, there's not much I can do. I can tell the individual companies that consult with me, hey, do this. And they'll be like, that's nice. No, we're, we're still going to focus on profit. So what I can do and where I make peace with is explaining how it works. And my biggest piece of advice to anyone, especially if you're in any kind of version of the corporate rat race and finances are a thing, is you have got to remove your emotions from it, which is so hard because we're so attached to money. It's how we survive. And it's also sort of part of our self-worth. If we get more money, then we're worth more. And get less money, the company doesn't value us. But there's a science and mathematic systems to compensation. And if you can look at it as coldly as the way businesses do, as business costs, it makes everything's so much clearer and you can actually make some really smart, intentional financial moves for yourself. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like 
tap into your sociopathic alter ego and you'll be just fine. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Don't care about any of this. I don't care about success at work. Don't care about any of that. Instead, look for large companies that have mixed model compensation. Go into these three or four fields that are usually low barriers to entry that no one wants to work for and just bank on a medium salary, but a great bonus and stock every year instead of the salary. View compensation in the cold, horrible lens that companies do, and it actually can work for you. Oh my I recommend God. doing that. <laughs> I am so shook because like I take everything so personally. <laughs> like, I, and it's, I, I, I try not to. I mean, when it comes to money, not really, but when it comes to like basically everything, every other form of currency in the workplace and especially like in creative fields I feel like there's a lot of currency that has nothing to do with dollars and cents all of that I take like wildly personally I need I need, I need to unpack that more so next thought spiral says are my more successful peers lucky or actually better than me wow what a good question my first thought is it doesn't matter because that doesn't take away from you and my second thought is it is never going to be that polar. I've been fortunate enough to work inside of companies, especially on how they promote. And to your earlier point, so many of it is done in like a chaos model of, well, we just happen to like this person. But there are companies that have started to put in more rigor um, as it relates to identifying scope, responsibility, impact, things that are quantifiable and qualifiable. And so I wouldn't call it either of those, though it could be both. There's probably many other reasons. But the more that you worry about why the reasons are, the more I feel like you're almost giving yourself permission not to succeed. Oh, my God. So succinctly stated. Thank you. Truly, it comes back to the thing that we were just discussing about, like, not taking things personally, being a little more pragmatic, sociopathic, whatever. <laughs> like, we're human beings with bodies and emotions that don't always make sense. And so we're primed to come up with like really intimate, emotionally threatening justifications for why things happened. A, like you said, it doesn't matter. And it's often not those things at all. Next Thought Spiral says, how does one balance working while momming and avoid internal comparison to those without kids? That is the worst. I, I mean, I can't speak to that because I'm not a mom. Well, I, I have so much sympathy and empathy because I, one of my closest friends, he used to be single and is now a father. And one of the best things was watching his like anti-parent communications now turn into pro-parent communications when companies would make updates that were either pro or against parents. My thought would just be, you have no one else to impress but yourself. You have no, no one else to prove anything to other than you and your children. And I love the thought, what other people think of you is none of your business. Oh, tattoo that on my freaking forehead right? backwards so I can read it when I look <laughs> it in the mirror. Next Thought Spiral says, people who can sacrifice their comforts for their passion, I can't anymore. That's, I mean, is it, but is your passion really like doing Excel spreadsheets? <laughs> like, is, is, is the, like, I am so angry that I wasted a decade in New York City, which is like the biggest, you live to work. Work is where, is how you're defined. The longer you work, the better you are. And we're all idiots going like 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. working, bringing our laptops home. My passion was not making PowerPoints and Excel spreadsheets. And, and so I sacrificed so much of my time in my 30s when I was doing that. But now my passions are things that when I make sacrifices for, they don't feel like sacrifices. Like when I sit down and play saxophone for an hour, that's not me sacrificing an hour. That's something I enjoy and love doing. Dude, I'm so broken. The other day, my friend and I had to Google the <laughs> definition of a hobby. <laughs> What does that mean? Does not compute. <laughs> the definition was something like a leisure activity you do for enjoyment in your free time regularly. And I was like, <laughs> like breathing? <laughs> like, I don't know. Does I this don't... person know my mind? That's not something that I can do. I know. I have had <laughs> hobbies. Rest assured, I have had hobbies. But like, I am so ruined that like every time I've had a hobby, I've wanted to like be a little enterprising with it. Like at least like make an amazing Instagram reels about it so everyone would know. Like that's not honest, you know, like I took a pottery class the other week, a six week pottery course. Actually, I was the worst one in class. I should have just let that be. I should have just had that as like a private precious experience. No, I wrote newsletters about it like why? Why? I just need a passion that I don't monetize. <laughs> well, yeah, and that you love for love for for you. Luckily, I'm a little bit fortunate in the fact that I love video games, so it's something extraordinarily easy. I, mm. It's personal; I can just do it on myself, and I've done it since I was a teenager. 
But I mean, I, if we had time, we would deep dive into why you felt the need to publicize that pottery and forgive yourself <laughs> for it and understand why. And did you enjoy it or did you enjoy the PR no. that it kind of manifested? Neither. <laughs> no, I, yeah, you know what I, I enjoyed? <laughs> I enjoyed like, okay, I was trying to like find the lesson in this pottery course. I was like, I am so fucking bad at this pottery. I'm the worst one in class. I swear to God. Everyone else has like come away from this with like eight incredible throne pots. And I have like a wonky vase that looks like it has a benign tumor and that nothing else. And I was like, (laughs) what is the lesson here? I was like, I think it's really good for me to practice being bad at something to inoculate myself against trying new things in my career that I'm not really good at at first. I'm like, why am I taking away a career lesson from something that was just supposed to be precious and pure and for fun and with my hands what's wrong with me (laughs) (laughs) that's interesting i did one pottery class once and i it sucked and i hated it and i was like i'm so glad other people have this talent and i'm so glad i learned that i do not i know it's too hard it's too hard so maybe (laughs) that's what it was i was like i'm bad at this but it has to be worth it for some reason because the the pots and vases and bowls that i made oof girl no I had to turn it into a story. I had to turn it into like this hero's journey of how I like was so bad at pottery, but look what I learned, you know, and and here are these <laughs> objects that are like props in the theater of this tale, you know, it's just like, I don't know. I'm going to say something a little controversial um, and hopefully no one gets mad at me because I have nothing but respect if you're talented at pottery. I was bored. I wanted like, where was the ghost soundtrack? Where would like, this was supposed to immerse my soul. Like, I was just like, this is messy and uncomfortable and I don't have support on my back. I'm a bigger guy. Like, what is this stupid stool? Tell me um, about it. Why, I know. Like, and I'm like, I'm so glad other people are talented on it, but this is not my thing. And the fact there was no ghost soundtrack playing in the background, I was like, this is not this Thank thing. God you said that. People are out here lying about <laughs> pottery. I'm like looking at YouTube. I'm watching the Great British Pottery Throwdown. I was like, this is going to change my life and make me like a homesteading goddess trad wife angel <laughs> no i walked out of there every single cast covered in clay having made nothing it was just it was shameful yeah. wow what is this podcast about next thought spiral <laughs> someone says oh this one's rough i oh god listen my heart goes out to the submission they say i'm so proud of my partner for chasing his dreams but it means i can't because we need steady income. Ah, that is a rough one. My response to anyone who's in that is you have got to make a compromise with your partner that there's a certain time the trade-off will be reversed and get that commitment from your partner. So I think it's fine. And I think especially in long-term relationships, one person does a little bit of self-sacrificing, takes care of one thing while the other generates income. But once that person is steady, safe, or has reached a point of clemency within their role, they're like, eh, I think I'm to leave it. They have got to be willing to switch roles with the other. Very practical advice. Thank you for that. Okay, a couple more thought spirals. This next person asks, what if I'm not jealous? Like, if I feel happy in my position, does that mean I'm not ambitious? That's the definition of happiness. <laughs> I tell people all the time, especially on compensation. One of the easiest ways to make more money is to do the same role at other companies um, because the market shifts always move faster than the way annual raises do at companies. So if someone is like a project manager for two years at a pharma company, they can probably make 15 to 20 percent more just moving to another company. And I was doing a live and one person said, but I really love my job. I've been here for eight years. I love my coworkers. My boss is someone I used to date, but now we just have the most amazing chemistry. My work is really easy. I can work pretty much remote. And I was like, I can tell the passion in your voice. And she was like, I know I can make 20% more every once in a while I get LinkedIn DMs. Like, should I be taking them? And I'm like, why would you? You're happy. If you are are fully vested with the knowledge that you can make more, but you are actively choosing not to, and your hierarchy of needs is fine, you can live, eat, support, put some money in savings, buy some things for yourself from time to time. That's the definition of happiness. That's that's where everybody wants. Yep. Oh my God. I'm not as self-actualized as that person, but I will say I stand by many difficult decisions that I've had to make in my career that involved sacrificing money for freedom. My freedom to control my time, my schedule, my intellectual property, whatever, my creativity, my mind, that is everything to me. And I have sacrificed money for freedom at many junctures. And I I stand by every single one of those decisions. So, you know, feeling content is a certain type of freedom. No raise is worth that sacrifice. One million percent. Next Thought Spiral says, why am I jealous of people getting promotions I don't even want? (laughs) You know what's funny? I made a TikTok video once, similar to what you had said, when I started getting into consulting, 
it was the first time I was free. Like I had done nothing but corporations until I was, since I was 20, other than going to South America and then sort of having that revelation about time. And I hated going back to work. And I worked for great companies. I mean, Spotify was one of the best companies I worked for. But I was like, I have got to command my time to you from like 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., five days a week, and sometimes on weekends. So when I became a consultant, I was like, that freedom. But I would still make videos from time to time. And I would still do interviews from time to time to show people what I was talking about. And so I interviewed with this role with HBO Max, and I knew I was doing well. And I started to stress myself because I'm like, I'm obviously not going to take this job. How do I tell them this? Everyone is so great. Like the recruiters reached out to me a few times saying, hey, you know, we're, we're probably getting pretty close. And then I got the call saying they wanted someone else. And my first thought was, how dare you? And then I was like, beating my, I'm like, why am I upset? This was literally the perfect outcome. I did not have to I was not, why, like that sting of rejection is still Mm. so central to the human experience. So if you feel it, I say laugh at yourself because that's again, just something you get to sit and unpack. Why the hell am I jealous for a promotion I didn't even want? Like, what does that say about me? And I think you can get into some just amazing self-discovery with that. Such a good point. And again, to relate it back to the sort of romantic analog, I saw a very funny post the other day that said something like, I wouldn't hook up with the Grinch, but I would be happy to know that the Grinch wanted to hook up with me. (laughs) (laughs) The the perfect human being response. We just want other people to want us. We don't want Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Oh, God. Okay. Next thought spiral goes, I want to talk about being jealous of people who enjoy their jobs while trying to de-center the importance of my job. Wow. That is a tough one. And I feel bad because I felt so privileged. I thought everyone had the same career joy that I did because, but 10 years into my job, I'm like, this was the perfect fit. I, I fit, this is great. And then I met with like a program manager for an insurance company that helps medical equipment for horses. And they're like, this is not something that gives me any passion. I don't love this. I can do this. It pays okay. And I can kind of find pride in doing it well, but no, this is not my passion. So I think it just becomes a thing of, can you find your passion? And sometimes that is in switching to a new role or helping to identify what are the things that actually excite you or engage you. And one of the biggest pieces of advice that I give is change in industry. One of the biggest things that I really have seen so many people thrive in is by working in industries where they feel personally attached to it instead of just the first company that hired them in their location. Yeah. Actually, this reminds me, my partner Casey and I are constantly watching like little science explainer videos on YouTube where, you know, Mm -hmm. career experts will be interviewed about fulfillment and career because he and I both work for ourselves and we both struggle a lot with stress and career and survival and happiness. You know, these are not like Mm -hmm. unique concerns. But recently we watched a YouTube video produced by the Harvard Business Review in which they interviewed Arthur C. Brooks, who is a Harvard Business School professor and co-author with Oprah Winfrey of Build the Life You Want. This video was titled, Can Work Make You Happy? Should It? And he said a lot of things in this video But the two things that he said can make you happy in the workplace were not what I would necessarily expect. And the two things were earned success. So like if you feel like you haven't necessarily just like gotten lucky or, you know, if you feel like your labor has actually produced an outcome that you think is commensurate, that can lead to happiness. And then the other thing was service to other people. So it almost like doesn't even matter what you do in the office, like how, quote unquote, meaningful your job is or how passionate you are about it. If you're helping people who are, say, like under you in the workplace or if you're just like getting coffee for your coworkers or whatever, like if you're participating in service to your fellow workers, doesn't matter what you're doing or if you're passionate about it, that will help you feel happy. I found that pretty radical. That is amazing. And I think it just all ties back to that. One of my favorite phrases, and I try to live it every day, people will not remember what you did, but they will remember how you made them feel. Totally. I want to bring up some thought spirals that are a little bit more specific and personal that were DM'd to me. Someone says, I'm jealous of my college self who knew exactly what she wanted to do, creative arts therapy, before dropping out during COVID. And now I work minimum wage at a debt collection agency. I never got COVID, but my brain never recovered from the rest of it to go back to school. Everyone at this company is so excited for me personally and thinks I'll climb the ladder rapidly. But like, should I really stay in a comfy job that is ruining people's lives? Oh, God. 
so that's something you have to do some soul searching on as it relates to your ability to do work that fundamentally potentially does ruin or I would say we, we probably don't have the impact to ruin other people's lives, but it's definitely not something that's bringing them joy. At the same time, I can relate. I'm jealous of my college self when I thought I was a good musician and thought that I would play music all the time. <laughs> and then $25,000 and a bachelor's degree in saxophone performance later, I'm like, oh, this was a waste of time and money. To me, we're just, we're not set up in a way, in a system that allows us to pursue our dreams meaningfully. So while I always tell people, follow your dreams, do what's right for you, what I found to be the best is a realistic middle ground. So I happened to find a role that I did love that also paid well, that allowed me to pursue music as a very loving hobby. So I think there are ways to merge yourself. You are still super, super young. If you just happen to leave college in, in COVID times, you have plenty of years ahead of you to go back. If you can make peace with the fact that you earn well and do well in this and potentially have growth, there's never a time where anyone is ever going to, to regret being developed and learning a new skill. That's something you can always take with you. And then there are adjacent roles and adjacent industries where are not so destructive that you could apply that while you embrace yourself and your passion. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean, life is short, but life is long. And like it is not the sort of situation that I feel like a lot of boomer parents sort of conveyed or Gen X parents conveyed where like you stick with a career your whole life and you have to like find your no. path and no. None of that. Okay. I think this one is related and it's important. How happy are you supposed to be at work? Motivated, joyful. You want to enjoy the thing you spend 40 plus hours a week doing, but it is your job Maybe I should put more effort into my personal life instead of worrying about loving my job. It's hard not to compare or be envious of people who clearly love what they do and feel such an unwavering sense of purpose. It's that like same concept of like being anti-corporation, anti-career in a way, but also knowing you have to do this for so many hours a week. You should probably like it to some degree. So I think that requires self-reflection into what it is that you're doing. So if this was someone whose job was to create Excel formulas, I would find it difficult for them to like, I love doing this. I mean, who knows? But you know, I would say maybe, yes, invest in your personal life. But if it's someone who is a manager and they mentor people and they teach people and they help people grow and they help people develop and they promote and inspire and give feedback and try to coach and develop and mold, then I think that that's a wonderful thing to be passionate about. Yeah, it is like a very worthwhile reckoning to engage with regularly though like how much should I really love my job versus right. like the things I do outside of my job I don't think you actually have to love your job it just shouldn't make you no. miserable you know exactly <laughs> last thought spiral someone says at my job I have a coworker that gets the nastiest career jealousy a promotion came up at my job for two positions and me and my other coworker got it but three of us internally applied. The coworker that didn't get the job has become the most difficult for me and the other coworker that got it. He wouldn't speak to the other girl for three months. And if we try to help him, like give him feedback or ask for him to do anything, he will not do it. But if someone else asks or tells him to do something, he's fine and he'll do it. It's the most frustrating thing ever. So I guess the question is like, how do you deal with someone in the workplace who's career jealous of you? <laughs> So what's, I couldn't help but notice the gender. So I also wonder if there's a little bit of sexism there. Um, I've spent decades coaching the fragility of men who don't get promoted and feel personally offended when women do. So there, to me, there's two things. And the me at 30 would have been very different than the me at 40, the one at 45. Right now, I would confront it head on. I was like, let's talk about it. If I was in your situation, I would be jealous. So I'm not speaking for you. The worst thing you never do is speak for someone else's feelings. But a lot of I statements, it had this happen to me. If I did this, I would be jealous. I've noticed that you have become difficult and difficult means this, not responding to IMs, a lot of very curt responses. You've canceled every lunch meeting that we had. Twice you've now interrupted me at meetings. You've left in the middle of conversations. So if I were in your shoes, I would want to say to you, hey, you know what? I'm jealous, but congratulations because you deserve it. And that's great. I'm just jealous and I'm going to manage to do that. And I thought that one of the best things to do would be to tell you, hey, I'm jealous, but congratulations. And I'm just kind of working through it. So if that is how you feel, let's talk about it. Let's go through it because I do want to see you successful. And what you're doing now is not working for you. Had I been like in my 30s, my thought process would be, it is not my responsibility to manage your emotions. I'm here to succeed. Uh, me and this other person got promoted. You didn't. That's unfortunate. You can't win against the house. And you are responsible for managing those feelings. 
Yeah, no, I love the advice of confronting it head on because then you can really stand by your approach to the situation because you are mature about it. Mm -hmm. And also like that person's being passive aggressive. Who knows if they even realize you see it clearly. Like (laughs) maybe this is too generous, but like perhaps it's a call for help. Maybe this person wants to be perceived, you know, it's annoying to have to manage fragile masculinity and all of that. But You do have to work with this person every day. So like confronting him generously, yeah, to your point, with I statements and empathy would probably have a pretty productive outcome. I'm thinking best case scenario, yes, but I'm being generous with with this this person to be like, you know what, thank you for seeing me, but it's just as possible you get someone. How dare you talk to me this way? You're thinking so highly of yourself. I don't even think of you. You're imagining this and trying to gaslight your experience. Yeah. So good luck. Uh, no, <laughs> no, it's really tough. Again, like you can never predict how people will behave and what people are thinking. But if you can stand by your own approach to the situation, I guess that's the best that you can hope for. I have one more question for you before we go. And that is, what do you think is the one thing that people are overthinking the most with respect to career jealousy? And what is the one thing you think people are underthinking the most? I think people are overthinking the benefits to where the objects of their jealousy are and what they're actually reaping. I remember one case in which someone told me that they were very jealous of someone because of of their perceived success. And I had had a meeting with that person the night before saying how miserable she was. She hated it. She hated the the pressure. She hated being under the magnifying glass. She was like, I would give anything to give back this $8,000 and go back to where I was before. So I think it's it, the grass is always greener on the other side for a reason. And what I always tell people to encourage is a little bit of a thought exercise. Imagine someone came up to you to tell them that they were jealous of you. How would you respond? Like, would you be like, what are you jealous of? Like, I'm here doing Excel spreadsheet formulas for rectal thermometers for horses. Like, that, that is not an impressive thing. And I think, guess what, what you're thinking too little of would be, I guess thinking too little would more translate for me into condensing that into action. And is the action going to be acceptance? Is the action going to be self-discovery? Is the action going to be, I'm going to put myself into a one-year plan so that I can reach that? Is the action going to be reach out to the person and talk to them about it? That's where I think I would fall. Dan, thank you so much for doing this interview. Thank if you. people want to keep up with you and your work and help you rebuild, where can they do that? <laughs> so I'm at the Dan from HR on TikTok and then Dan from HR just on all my other socials. I'm just very excited. I just finally opened up YouTube. That was like the last one. And I am finally now making content like every other day or so. It took, uh, it took most of the summer off. Awesome. Thank you again. Thank you very much for having me. This is wonderful. And thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode of Magical Overthinkers. Now is the point where I end by sharing a bit of evidence-based advice for how we overthinkers can get out of our own heads this week. This one's pretty silly, but I was totally delighted when I read it. It comes from a clinical psychologist named Liz White, writing for Psychology Today in a piece titled A New Way to Cope with Overthinking. One of the techniques that she recommends for interrupting a really destructive and negative thought spiral has to do with speaking your thoughts out loud to yourself in a silly or ridiculous voice. (laughs) White says, quote, If you experience your thoughts as an internal voice, saying your thoughts in a silly or funny voice can be effective in helping you diffuse. For example, say your thoughts to yourself as Daffy Duck or Miss Piggy or any other cartoon character, or your thoughts as your favorite film or TV character. I'm not necessarily very good at impressions, so I won't be saying my thoughts out loud to myself in a Daffy Duck voice. But sort of casually, I actually have implemented this advice before. I have a couple go-to silly voices. Maybe once we get to know each other a little better as I continue this podcast, I'll demonstrate one for you or not. Depends how (laughs) brave I'm feeling. But it can actually be really disarming to use humor and surprise to sort of infuse a glitch in that terrible thought spiral process that so many of us overthinkers get into. So next thought spiral you find yourself in, perhaps consider giving this silly voice technique a try. Thank you again for listening. And until the next thought spiral, remember, think it over. Just don't overthink it. Magical Overthinkers was created and hosted by Amanda Montel and edited by Jordan Moore of The Pod Cabin. Our theme music is by Casey Kolb. Thank you to our magical manager, Katie Epperson, coordinator, Reese Oliver, and Network Studio 71. 
Be sure to follow the pod on Instagram at Magical Overthinkers. We're also on YouTube, link in show notes, and ad-free episodes, as well as behind-the-scenes episodes.